what about uh, anger? Is there a difference between how men and women are viewed when they're angry? Anger is an energy. Um, yeah, I, and this is something else I do in, in my uh, workshops. I will ask when we're talking about gender and anger and that sort of thing, um, when are women praised for their anger? And I ask men and women that. And generally what I get is never or in defense of your children. And that's true. And I ask them, um, what do people call angry women? And I think you can probably guess, and I don't need to say it. Yeah, we know what it was back in 2013, don't we? But now it's a little bit more polite, but a bit more acerbic, isn't it? It's now a Karen. Exactly. Um, because there is a perception that uh, angry women are judged, tend to be judged more harshly than angry men. In the same way that men are judged more harshly for other emotions, uh, maybe they show, uh, they show that they're, they're feeling bad or they look like they're sad or they're depressed. They may be judged harshly on, on those issues too, but women tend to be judged harshly in regard to anger and assertiveness. Yeah, but that's because of the roles that society teaches us that men and women have. Um, so, well, not so much now, but certainly when we were growing up, the the man was the you know the hunter gatherer. The woman was the the one that looked after the children and kept the home. That's I'm not saying it was right, but that's how it was when we were growing up, wasn't it? Yeah, that's how it was when I was growing up. Yeah, I mean it's going to be different now because times have very much changed, but. Um, Alpha females weren't really common. I mean, they were common. You saw them. You saw them in every family. The mother was the alpha female, usually. Yeah, in some families. Uh, I, know, I knew a family where the woman was in charge. Yeah, but more often than not, you know, it's because of the roles. And, um, you know, alpha females are a bit more prevalent today and more, you know, socially acceptable today than they were back then. Yeah, I think uh, that's because now times are different. Yeah. So how does that fit into a domestic violence relationship? Well, you're, in, in a certain way, you're crossing a cultural norm uh, to be angry. But, but it's more how you're judged or perceived when you are maybe out of that relationship or if you are in the relationship and you wind up saying something that isn't very nice to your partner or whatever. Nobody knows why you're saying it, but you sound angry, you look angry. Um, it's, it's not an emotion that, it's not like women don't get angry. It's just that they tend to be less direct with it, uh, more sort of this way. Okay. Um, have, are you aware of any studies that have been done with regard to the difference in men and women's brains? Well, actually, there's, there's uh, a study that just came out uh, with Daniel Amen. I watched Dr. Oz, so he's on Dr. Oz. And um, he did the largest gender-based study on the brain, and it was uh, 46,000 brain scans. Let me interrupt you for a second. I know you said that you saw it on Dr. Oz, but is this, is this somebody, Dr. Amen, is this someone that you know or um, have researched other than oh, him on TV? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Dr. Amin is somebody who's, uh, he's controversial. What he does is he does brain scans on people who have been violent and people who have been using drugs and, and that sort of thing, and he compares them with a normal brain. And he shows areas of the brain that light up or areas of the brain that are deficient and that sort of thing. Um, and he, he, he does that comparison. So he compared men and women's brains, and he found that... Not or expertise. Thanks so much. can see why he objected, can you? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, this guy that she's talking about isn't even in the courtroom. So she's testifying about someone else's expertise, which, you know... You can't do. No. I mean, I suppose you can in a way, but, you know, it is beyond the scope, isn't it? It's well, yeah, because you're not there to talk about anyone else's credibility or anything. I wonder if he scans Jody's brain against that of a normal brain and finds out a distinct increase of marshmallows. <laughs> 
May continue. Ms. Viola, in your experience, have you seen with the women that you have treated, have you noticed them to be empathetic? Yes, I have noticed them to be empathetic. In fact, one of the things we used to say at the shelter was they over-empathized. Okay. Uh, and is that something in particular that you've noticed with women? Yes, I've, I've noticed that with women, although uh, I'm sure that had I worked with some men who were battered, I would notice empathy with them too. But you tend to notice it with women. And you tend to notice that when they, they get really upset um, and there's been an incident, that once they have time to have a little recovery period, they tend to feel for their partners for at least a period of time and s sympathize with them. As I said, when I started at the shelter, the women in the shelter would say to me, you know, our partners have been abused as children, and we understand that. And so when, you know, when we, we feel bad for them, and we know that they're acting this way because of how they were treated when they were children. So. But they are not responsible for their partner's happiness. They are not responsible for their partner's feelings. So they shouldn't feel as though it's their responsibility because they are not responsible for that. No, but it's what they carry on their shoulders. Yeah, because I guess the partner's done a, depending on the situation in the case, probably done a certain amount of guilt tripping if there's, um, you know, any narcissism there. Yeah, or emotional blackmail. Yeah, exactly. So women having empathy, does that, how does that play into uh, a domestic violence relationship? Well, it, it is one of the factors that can keep somebody in a relationship for a longer period of time because you keep understanding why that person is doing what they're doing and you sort of dismiss how you feel to look at how they feel. And so it, it can keep you stuck. Keep you from leaving? Keep you from leaving. And are you aware of any studies other than... Um just because you saw something on Dr. Oz, have you actually read through studies that uh, talk about women's empathy? No, I have not. Okay. Are you aware of um, a study with regard to uh, empathy and brain scans? Now, if that's not a leading question, I don't know what is, but one is being silent. Yeah, maybe he's probably seeing where she's going with it. Yeah, but he had cause to object there because even, you know, that jumped out at me very leading. I am, but it's, it's a study that Dr. Amon did. Yes, oh, right, okay. And um, with regard to Dr. Amon, that's, you, weren't, you didn't partake in that study, right? No, I did not. Okay, and brain scans aren't your specialty? No, they're not. Okay. Uh, however, are you able to understand what Dr. Amon did? I'm under, able to understand what he reported. Okay. That I think everybody would understand what he reported. All right. And did he report with regard to women and empathy? He did. He reported that women's uh, brains... Objection, lack of foundation, Did he just say, objection, lack of foundation, Dogbert? Sounded like that, but I'm sure it might have been something else. Juan, have a word with yourself, mate. Approach, please. Forty-five trips around the Marshmallow Garden later. We were talking about women and how, how you've noticed women have empathy. Uh, which can cause problems for them in their relationships if they're in an abusive relationship. Um, what about the men that you treat in, in the groups that you have, your men groups? Do, do you have a goal for them? I have, you know, I mean, besides their goals for themselves, um, one of the goals I have is to try to change belief systems because... If you don't change the belief, the behavior change doesn't stick as long, and it just takes longer to change beliefs, like beliefs about using aggressions or belief about themselves. Um, 
you know, those beliefs about what the world is like for them, you know. So I work hard to change the belief uh, about themselves and the belief about um, using aggression to solve problems. And do you work with empathy with the men that you work with? Yes, I, uh, we do a lot of empathy work with the men. And um, I, I gave an example this morning of one of the exercises that uh, we do. But I, I, I think about, for a lot of the men, that uh, once they can I- identify with their own victimization and how they were you know, mistreated as children, uh, most of them, that it is easier then to make the leap to understand what it's like for someone else. And it's harder, the, the way I see empathy move generally in group is that first people feel bad for what happened to them. They, they feel bad about their lives and how their lives are looking. And then they identify with the other men in the program and they start to, to feel bad for them. And the, the, the place that is easier to get people, even very violent people, to identify is if they have children. It's easier to move through because they tend to empathize with their children. And the last place that they tend to empathize is with their adult partner. And so we're moving in the direction of being able to empathize with the adult partner. But um, sometimes we have to use other things. And and one of the things, and and I think about one of the young men in gangs that we worked with, and he had a daughter, and we asked him what he would like a relationship for his daughter to look like, to get him to start thinking about what he would tolerate with his own daughter and how he treated his own wife. So is that the way, is, is that how you try and build empathy with the men in your group? By talking about situations close to them, but not them specifically? No, I talk about situations with them specifically and situations that aren't about them specifically. She's probably got a storybook locked away in her cupboard, hasn't she? Yeah, and I'm sure she's going to start bringing it out more and more. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier to empathize with, with someone else, but... It's easier for them to empathize with themselves when they were children, which is why you know I sometimes ask, ask them to think about when they were children, to the empathy that they might have for themselves as children. I remember one of the men was talking about um, his little brother and him, and they were they were um, aggravating the heck out of their dad. Their mother was at the market, and their father took a knife and chased them. And they were running away, and, and he was trying to protect his little brother, and he was pushing his little brother under a bed, and his dad was doing this with a knife. And, and uh, the mother came home, and the, guns, or the, the knife is placed back in his waistband, and nobody says anything about what happened. And the mother doesn't know what happened, but the little boys don't talk about it. And this was a man in his 40s, and as he's telling this story, he feels so emotionally about it, he starts to cry and, and talk about how afraid he was. And it's that ability to see not only that, that you can feel things so much longer from when they actually happen, that 30 years can pass and that you can still have feelings about something that happened to you, that you can still be traumatized by what happened to you, and that... So, so he notices the long-term effects. So when he wants his partner to forgive him, he's got more understanding that it might take his partner longer than he wants it to take, but that he also sees what it's like for him. And then you can say to somebody, well, how do you think it feels for the people in your life when you, do, when you treat them badly? What do you think it feels like for them? But you give people a chance to really get into their own feelings. You don't ram anything down their throats. It's a good method and it's effective, but if you are dealing with someone who is without empathy and, you know, without any sort of compassion whatsoever, i.e. Jodie Arias, then it's pearls before swine. It's a waste of time, isn't it? Yeah, because it... It's not the same thing. No. Because she doesn't feel any of that guilt. No. And she won't be able to relate to, you know, any sort of pain. The, no. You know, she, she wouldn't be able to relate that to herself dishing it out. So, um, you know, once again, this is just... 
waste of time. Hogwash. Yeah. Well, along those lines, um, let me give you a hypothetical. No, God, please, no, no, no. Okay. Right. So let's say you have um, a man who's in your group, and he's talking to you about his childhood. Okay. In his childhood, this as a boy, he had extreme neglect from his parents. Uh, at times, this boy was homeless, didn't have a place to live. Uh, at times, that because he was homeless, he was unable to clean himself or have good clothes, and he would get made fun of at school. At times, he knows that his parents uh, were drug addicts, so he had to deal with that. At times, there were he would know that he would see um, or hear about violence between his dad to his mom and his mom to his dad. I think every single person in the world would have complete empathy for this story if it was anyone telling it but Wilmot. Somebody um, growing up in a family situation like this, even if he doesn't see everything, but he's part of this family, what do you expect for that man now, now that he's a man in your group, how is that person, what, what type of things do you see then as a man treating him? Well, you see, you can see a lot of things because there are variables that can help him along the way. But if you're making an assumption that there's no intervention and... Let's assume there's no intervention. Let's assume that he does not have an adult to count on. Uh, at a young age? It's very difficult for a child who grows up like that not to have a number of issues in relationship because children in, who grow up in abusive families tend to have a lot of feelings of powerlessness. They tend to be... Um, they tend to have some... Not answering the question, lack of foundation. This was not an abusive family mentioned. Uh, may we approach? You may approach. Ms. Lilet, somebody, a child who grows up in an environment like that, um, who is neglected, who can't bathe all the time, who has parents who are violent to each other, who have parents who are drug addicts. Would you consider that abusive? Yes, Is that an I abusive would. family environment? It's, a, it's an abusive family environment. Okay. So I know you just mentioned abusive. So even though if that child necessarily wasn't, wasn't hit, do you consider this type of environment for a child to grow up in? Is that abusive? It's very abusive. Okay. So now, back to what you would see with a man who were you coming what do you expect to what do you expect this child to do when he grows up how do, how does this child deal with what he lived with as a child well there's something that happens based on the personality of the child and how they take it in it's whether they blame themselves for what happened it's whether they feel like there's any way out for them but what they've learned is a lot of negative coping skills what they've learned if you think about what someone learns. And I think about that, you know, I, I love my parents and I think they were terrific parents. Hang on, where are we now? Because weren't we just going over her past and her background? Um, well, why are we talking about hypotheticals? I have no idea where they're going with this. I think what they try to do is bring all this in to make it look like Travis was a monster and this is what he did. I know, but I'm just... I was just waiting for Wilmot to get back to kind of something about a background because please forgive me if I missed it, but I can't recall her saying anything, right, we're going to move on to this. We just kind of morphed into, you know, all these scenarios that, you know, some have some stuff to do with the case, some have absolutely nothing to do with the case, but I keep saying it's a waste of time. Yeah, of course it is. But even when you have terrific parents, sometimes you say, you know, if I have kids, I'm not going to do exactly what my parents did, or there's this thing I'm not going to do that my parents did. 
And when your back's against the wall... Back's against the walls, guys, yeah! yeah. And you get upset with your kids, sometimes you wind up channeling the very thing you said you weren't going to say. You know, that some of those things like, because I said so, because, you know, the, the things that we say sometimes as parents. And when someone has learned to be fearful, because I don't think you can live in a drug addicted family with people who are violent and not be fearful. You learn to be fearful. You go into your adult life and where that plays out, it may not play out in your professional life in the same way. In your professional life you might be okay because you're not challenged emotionally in, at the same kind of level that you are as a, as in an intimate relationship. So what do you mean professionally speaking? That person can have you a can good You can be successful in your job. You can have a good job, but where you tend to be tested the way you were, or in a, not exactly the way you were, but emotionally is, is in your intimate relationship. So what I hear from the men that I work with is they're, they get in a situation with their partner and they're thrown back to that powerlessness that they had when they were kids and they don't know what to do with it. And so they act to, to stop that, that powerlessness. And a way to stop powerlessness is to get bigger and more powerful, either verbally, emotionally, physically, than that other person who they see as making them feel powerless. And the other thing I think that's really important to look at with children is that kids don't have cognitive ability to explain what's happening to them. They don't have the language to say what's happening and they don't have the life experience. So they're left, kids are pretty feeling beings. They're left with the feelings. And the feelings are what come up when they're in an adult relationship and they feel powerless. Does having this type of traumatic childhood, does it affect somebody uh, when they're young, like say up to six or seven years old versus if they were a teenager when it started to happen? There are things that happen to older kids that can be tolerated a lot better than when they're little uh, because older kids have the ability to have friendships. Maybe they've had a solid childhood until they're older. And so they've had this period um, where they've had consistency, they've had a good life, they've had people they can count on, and then they have something traumatic happen in their teenagers but they have more of an ability to handle it, where little kids, you know, may not. Uh, for instance, um, family that came into the shelter uh, with five children under the age of six. I was originally, you know, just going to say that this actually kind of is true for me because, you know, a lot of the abuse, the, the early abuse that happened, happened to me before the age of seven. You know, I had serious beatings as a small child, so... Um, that explains a lot about my later life, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, actually. Um, in terms of, like, forming and keeping friendships, isn't it? Yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of going to talk about that, but because she illust did illustrate that point perfectly, even to a layman like me and, and, and a lay person, a lay lady like you. Yeah, but she's telling another story. Yeah, it's Jack and Ori again, isn't it? It is. Again, we, we don't need it hammered home to us. We get the point. And I'm sure the jury understood what she was saying. For crying out loud, can we please move on? Uh, the infant was suffering failure to thrive based on what was going on in the family. All of these children were little. All, f all of these children had full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder and were, would hide under beds when any adult came in the room. It didn't matter if you were male or female. Um, they were afraid of adults and they were very hypervigilant and it took them a little while to be able to be comfortable with even walking, you know, being able to walk in the room with them. So things that are tolerated by teenagers may be very hard to tolerate for a small child. And so a child who grows up like this, who has this type of childhood when they're young, and they grow up, do they learn how to deal with their relationships to, without intervention? Do they have a specific way of how they deal with relationships because of what they learned when they were a child? Well, I wouldn't say that it was specific necessarily, but I would say that, that 
they would not have the, the skills to deal with an intimate relationship because they didn't learn the skills to deal with an intimate relationship. I mean, most of us probably haven't seen our parents fight a lot. You know, some parents will go behind closed doors and they'll have their arguments and whatever. But if your parents acted out a lot in front of you, you're shaken up in a different way than when you don't see that. If you see loving affection between your parents and it's consistent, you see that that's how you treat somebody in a loving relationship. I always remember my dad coming home from work and... Stand. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank God for you. Okay. Uh, all right. What, uh, are you familiar with the term chronic combat readiness? Yes. What does that mean? Chronic combat readiness is a term that uh, was used in an article by Bruce Perry, who um, does a lot of work with children who have committed violent crimes or children who've grown up in abuse. And what he says is that if you live in, uh, in an abusive household, that what you grow up with is the kind of situation you're living basically in a war zone. And if you live in a war zone, you have to be hypervigilant. You have to see the threat in things because a lot of these kids grow up and they see things as threatening that the rest of us wouldn't. They see, they see a look or a, a, a tone or whatever that we might be unaffected by that affects them in a, in a way. So chronic combat readiness is like the notion of living your life in a combat zone. If you grow up in a, in a violent family, and if you grow up from childhood in a violent family, and you have a number of years in that violent family, then you're flooded with stress hormones. You're, you know, you're, uh, you're in fight versus flight a lot of the time, which means you're, you're not operating from your cortex as much. You're operating from your reptilian brain. You're, you're operating from a place where the blood's rushing to your extremities, and you're ready to, to to fight. And kids do a lot of things in that situation. I mean, I would suspect um, a lot of the people I've worked with who bullied people came from violent families. And more often than not, those bullies are either bullied themselves by their father or their mother. Yeah, that is usually, it usually goes from generation to generation. Or if not father and mother, definitely an older sibling, but certainly someone in their, for, in their close family group. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, and the men that you've worked with in all the years that you've done this, um, do you have an idea of percentage of these men that you've worked with who have come from traumatic childhoods or abusive childhood families? My experience has been that almost everybody I've worked with has come from some sort of violent situation. And that could have been in foster care, that could have been with their, their parents, that could have been with their primary caregivers, and it could also be exacerbated by living in a violent neighborhood. Um, but the research was showing something like 60 to 70 percent, but that's because most of the research was done before people um, really understood that they lived in violence. In other words, they would say, well, you know, I, that happened to me because I needed to be disciplined. So, you know, of course I had to be beaten because I did something to deserve it. And so they didn't define it as, as violence. And it wasn't until after they understood violence a little better. So I would say it's much closer to, you know, we're not supposed to say 100% to anything, so I won't say 100%, but it's closer to that. And it depends, once again, on the degree to which somebody acts out in their own intimate relationship. The worst kinds of violence tend to be perpetrated by the people who've lived in the worst kinds of environments and grown up in the worst kinds of environments. Very telling that the discussing this particular subject and the camera flashed on um, Sandy. Can't you see? Yeah. Given what Jody said about Sandy and the way that Sandy treated her, I'm just saying, you know, that's what flashed to mind when the camera flashed to her. I don't know whether it was 
you know, intentional on the network's part or the, you know... Maybe they wanted to see what reaction she had. Yeah, could could be. But she seemed pretty stony-faced, didn't she? She did, yeah. Yeah, she's still got hair like an 80s rock <laughs> icon, though, hasn't she? <laughs> Bless her. <laughs> okay. Oh, judge this. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 3.15. Please remember the admonition you are excused. You may step down. We are at recess. One glass of milk, one cookie, and a nap later. Thank you. Please be seated. Ms. LaViolette, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. You may continue. Uh, Ms. Lavalette, I know that we talked about uh, victims of abuse and how, uh, in your practice, you've seen them not file police reports or not tell the doctors what actually happened. Uh, have you ever seen situations of what happens when um, these victims of abuse come to trial to testify? It's. Um, Approach. <laughs> the defense are doing the best, aren't they? They're doing the best to cover the backsides. Yeah, and they're also trying the best to drag this out. Yeah. A, they're dragging it out, and B, it's becoming desperate because they're trying to find examples of you know, people who, well, they have found examples of people who, you know, won't go to the authorities. However, those were in different situations to Jodie. Yeah, because for the simple reason is that didn't happen to Jodie. No, exactly. So, and now they're going to move on to why, you know, what happens when they testify. I mean, is this, Martinez is right. Is this absolutely necessary? It's not necessary at all. Like I said, they're just dragging it out now. I th yeah, uh, but I think what they're trying to do is with this is maybe excuse some of her behaviour on the stand while she was on there. Not in terms of she behaved badly, but, you know, the some demeanor. of the responses she gave and some of the bits where one tripped her up, uh, you know. So they, they're going to try and patch some holes in that and try and use... Um, Alice bucket hole here to bloody justify why Jodie did those things and why she responded the way she did while she was testifying. And it's just bloody horse bollocks, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Really. But I'm sure it will well, well I'm sure when one gets up there he will um Oh yeah, yeah. He'll he'll blow, you know, mammoth size Captain Jack Sparrow pirate ship holes in it. You yeah, know. he'll shoot bullets in it. Yeah, but huge nuclear missiles probably know he's won. Because <laughs> he's gone nuclear a few times, hasn't he? He has, yeah. I feel sorry for the poor bloody pens in that courtroom. And I, I, I anticipate they're not going to have a good time when he gets his, his mitts on Alice here. Ms. Lilette, in your practice, have you spoken with many women victims of abuse? Yes, I have. And you said that you've counseled these women as well, is that right? Yes, I have. And in speaking with them, have they talked to you about uh, whether or not they're able or have been willing to make police reports or report their abuser to the police? Yes, they have. Uh, and, oh, and have they talked to you about whether or not they have been willing to seek medical treatment when their abuser has harmed them? in some way. Yes, they've talked to me about that. And have they talked to you about when they've been called to testify? About yes. yes. Is that a yes? Okay. I'm sorry. Calm down, dear. And when they talk to you about these things, what do they say about police reports? Many of the women <laughs> Do 
don't make police reports. Some of the ones that do change their minds when the police actually come out, and they might change the story if they've called 911. Uh, they may come back. Some of the women actually follow through. It sort of depends on where they are in that whole progression of the relationship. Uh, of the relationship. But um, men, some of the women absolutely follow through with the police report. And then have they talked to you about, if they followed through with the police report, have they talked to you about what happens if they're called to testify against their abuser? And then have they talked to you about, if they followed through with the police report, have they talked to you about what happens if they're called to testify against Okay, she is just about to say the words, their abuser. Where exactly is she gesturing? And who is she gesturing to? Yeah, it's... That caught my eye. It's either towards Martinez or the juror. Yeah. Or, so, or I don't know, is there a picture of Travis up there? Or, or maybe she's, you know, gesturing towards Flores. But I found that gesture that she gave then very interesting. I don't know whether anybody else in the comments or out there picked up on that previously, but that just jumps out at me. Who but, is she gesturing to? Yeah, if you know, let us know. Yeah, I mean, it's more, you know, um, rhetorical than anything, but I don't know whether anyone's made anything of that, but that was just a very interesting moment, wasn't it? Yeah. It's their abuser. Yes. Um, many of them recant. I think we have about, th this is what I've been told um, by the court, that there are about 80%... Sustained. Have you worked with the courts before? Yes, I have. And when you worked with the courts, what have you done? Well, we had a domestic violence court in Long Beach. Yes. So the judge would meet with us um, on and off. Um, I have consulted on, on some cases. I, I'm not sure. Are you talking about with the... Well, the in order to have knowledge about... A, a, you were going to give us, I think, a, a number of some sort of what happens oh, when right. women recant. How do you have that knowledge? I have that knowledge... I have that knowledge. Because I've talked not only to people who run battered women's shelters, but also because I know some of the judges, or I knew some of the judges. We had a domestic violence court, and um, the judge... Is, is in Sedona now. She moved. And so we don't have that court anymore. But when we had it, we had it for eight years. And they gave us information about what they saw, as did the shelters talk about what they had seen, and the victim advocates, because there are victim advocates in the court. And, and then that information, plus you speaking with these women yourself, right? Yes. And so what happens when these women get to court? You said they recant. What does that mean? It means that oftentimes, and I would just like to say that frequently there's a long period of time between when a case is filed and when it gets to court. And so it might be a month, it could be two months before it, it actually gets into the court process. And during that time, if the couple stays together, many of them have reconciled. Do you know something? For the very first time since we started doing this case, I wondered what would happen, or what would have happened if Travis had actually survived, that she hadn't stabbed him as many times that she had or slit his throat, that perhaps her aim was bad, she, she tried to shoot him and missed, maybe stabbed him a couple of times not fatally. He survived and it became a, a case of attempted murder. What would her defense have been? Would she, try, would she have tried to go on with domestic violence, PTSD? Maybe, or <clears throat> maybe she would have tried... Well, that's the only way she could claim it, couldn't you? Yeah. Really, self-defense. Yeah, because pound to a penny, if he'd have survived this, he would have taken her to court because that would have been the last straw. Oh, of course he would have. He would have pressed charges. Yeah. Um... Obviously, she wouldn't have had the defense, um, you know, if it was a simple, not simple, but if it was an attempted murder charge, she wouldn't have had, 
you know, as as costly a defence as she has now, but it, it just it's just worth speculating, I think, what defence she probably would have tried to, to maintain if, you know, it he'd, would have been a case of attempted murder and he'd have survived. I think she still would have claimed self defence. Yeah, probably. But it's the only way she could claim it if she was trying to get a lesser sentence. But there were no marks on it and she fled the scene and um you know, she ended up with Ryan. So, you know, she could have gone to Ryan thinking she'd killed him, but she hadn't. You know, that's I know that it's it's kind of useless to ponder, but it's just entered my head for the first time and you know, it is open it up to our viewers and, and subscribers and see what you think. Um what do you think she would have said if if Travis had survived this? Or what he would have might have done. Or or yeah. You know, because I'm pretty sure that once this line had been crossed, he would have, you know, seen it through to the end and he he wouldn't have let her try and seduce him otherwise. I think his family would have been behind this as well, very much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you could... I... So what happens when a couple reconciles then with regard to the woman t wanting to testify? She doesn't want to testify because she doesn't want her partner to lose his job or she doesn't want uh, that on the record. And in California, there are a lot of uh, fees associated with, with um, proceeding. There's a, a penal code 273.5, uh, which is uh, called corporal injury to a spouse. And if you plead no low contendere that you're not contesting it, or you are found guilty of 273.5, you have to do 52 weeks in a batter's intervention program, a minimum of 52 weeks. You have to pay a fine to a battered women's program. You have to pay court fines uh, for going through the court process. You have to do community service, uh, and depending on what you do, depends on how much community service you have to do. And you also, um, oh, you're on probation for three years. Uh, can be reduced, you can file to have it reduced to two years, but you're on probation for a period of time. During that one year period, you also have co to come back to court every quarter with a court report from your program to show, you know, what you're doing and how you're progressing in that program. And so how does that affect women whether they recant or not? It affects the family financially. It also affects the women, depending on how angry the men are that they have to go through this process. And in my group, some of the men are very angry and blaming their partners for going, being st stuck in court, being st stuck in a program for a while, that sort of thing. But beyond that, uh, for many of the men, there's a relief in being in the program, actually. And, but they still have to pay fines. They still have to pay fees for the group every week. And in California, we do a sliding scale, which means we have to serve people on a, a range of incomes. So um, there's usually an opportunity for somebody to get help and to be able to afford it. But it is, it is financially sometimes a burden on the family to, to go through that. And so how often, based on all the knowledge you have with regard to the women you've seen and speaking with the judges and working with the domestic violence program, how often uh, do these women recant? There's uh, the estimates about 80% of the time. Okay. The, uh, so, if they're, so even if they're able to get to the point where they're able to make a report and not, and not change their mind when the police come, once they get to court, 80% of the time these women are actually taking it back? That's the estimate that I've been given. The other thing I would say is that um, for some of the women that the court process has been very difficult for them and they don't feel that they've gotten supported when they've, for them, stuck their necks out. And so the, the ability for them to then go forward and pro, you know, push or to report a second time is diminished because depending on what happens the first time. Does that go back to the feeling that uh, an abuse victim might have that no one's going to believe her if she reports it? it? It goes back to not only feeling believed, but feeling blamed. Because adult female victims are oftentimes blamed 
you know, child victims are seen as helpless child victims. But adults are oftentimes, their victimization is not rec uh, recognized in the same way. Okay, let me pose a hypothetical to you. All right. Let's say you're with somebody um, who is abusive, who is violent. You walk on eggshells around completely. Um, you keep a journal. You keep it secret from this person. Would you record what is going on in that journal? Of course I would. Every little detail. Okay. What if he finds it? Well, he wouldn't because I put it most in my most secret place that I wouldn't even reveal to anyone. Yeah. But if you are with a person who is, you know, highly suspicious and would search for stuff like that, maybe they would find it. Right. Now let's go to Jody because that's basically what they're trying to establish here. Um, she gave absolutely no indication that she was being abused by Travis. There was no physical evidence. There was no written evidence by her own hand. Even as um, Martinez has stated on many occasions, the dates that surrounded this alleged abuse, yeah, nothing was recorded by her. She didn't make any of her family members, the few friends that she had, any colleagues, any acquaintances. Yeah, she didn't even let a church know. Not a single soul knew anything about any domestic violence perpetrated against her but her. And it only, it didn't exist outside her own head. Yeah, her own marshmallow garden. There is no evidence now. Some of you may say to me, but Denty, that, is, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. True. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I suppose there are cases where, you know, someone is kept so isolated that there is absolutely no evidence of any physical or even mental abuse, right? But what we've got to remember is Jodie was not isolated. She was living in Wairika. There was no way he could have coerced her physically into not revealing anything about his ab alleged abuse towards her. Exactly. Nothing. Exactly. I mean, at that time, she was basically free of him. She, she, well, he thought he was free of her. He had another thing coming, didn't he? But Yeah, I know, but I'm thinking in her mind. Yeah. But all I am saying is that there is there was nothing to stop her, A, reporting it to the authorities when it happened, right? B, reporting it to other people see recording it in her own journals there was nothing to stop her doing any of that she had other options available to her that she didn't take so why alice laviolette is sitting up on that stand defending someone like this i have absolutely no idea well she's a jody fan isn't she yeah, she's Team Jody, and she's being paid, and she's being paid rather handsomely, because every hour she's on that stand, she's making she's making buck, isn't she? Of course she is. But you know, the more she talks, the more she goes into her expertise, and the more knowledgeable she sounds, the more incredulity that I feel that she's there, <laughs> and the, the even more incredulity I feel that her and Samuel's were given the time that they were given to prove this ridiculous PTSD and domestic violence theory. Well, the, the defence had no other witnesses, did they? They had nothing. This is the, the last, the, well, last line of defence they had. It was the best they come up with, and it's pretty piss poor, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. And they, they are seen as more culpable. So there's, there's a lot of judgment. And it depends on, on how you feel you're treated in the court, how you feel you're treated by the original police officers that come out. And in many cities, there's a domestic violence unit, and people are specially trained. And they go out, and they have what are called DART teams, domestic abuse response teams. And they actually go out um, and, and really take an interview and do that kind of thing and give resources to people. But if there are children involved, they also will send out a, a child abuse worker to respond with the kids. So if there are children involved, they have to send somebody out. So they're trying to address this in a more holistic way. So there's more support for families or, or individuals where there's domestic violence. 
Okay. Uh, when you have um, someone coming to your men's group, joining your men's group, do you do some sort of an intake or an interview with them? Yes, I do. Uh, and what do you do? Who do you interview? In my groups, I do something that's uh, unusual. Uh, and it's because of the work I did in the shelter. Because I worked in the shelter, I knew more of the whole story initially because I would have the women and children in the shelter. And I, and I knew what happened to them. And sometimes we'd have medical records or police records, but we'd also have the women and children that were interviewed. Um, so when I'd do my initial assessment with the men who were in relationship to those women, oftentimes the stories were very, very different. And so I thought it's very important for me to be able to do my work well and to really have a picture of what's going on and sort of assess a level of dangerousness. It's important for me to be able to interview the victim. So what I do is if there is no protective order and the couple is still together, I invite the victim to come into the intake, but I see them separately. So I get... Um, and, and if the, the um, victim does not want to come in, if the survivor does not want to come in, then I try to do an interview over the phone because I want to get a bigger picture about what's going on and I generally will not get it from the person who's coming into my program because there's a lot of shame attached to telling me, you know, about what happens. Um, actually, Lenore Walker used to say, um, you know, the old saying, if there are two stories, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, Lenore would say if there are two stories and there's domestic violence, the truth is worse than either of them because all, everybody's minimizing and denying. So even in, in that kind of a situation, I find that uh, people play down what's going on. So do you find that with the, the men who are coming in to ask you for help, that they play down what they've done? Or what's going on? Yeah, for instance, um, I might have somebody, I, I'll ask a question about substance abuse, for, you know, or drugs or alcohol, a problem in your family. And uh, that's not where I start, but that's a question that I, that I will ask. And, um, you know, one of the men said, no, you know, we're social drinkers and we have, you know, a couple martinis at night. And so I asked his partner, his wife, the same thing, and I said, if uh, our drugs or alcohol, you know, a problem in your family? And she said, absolutely. And I said, well, what's, what's a problem, drugs or alcohol? She said, alcohol. And I said, why is that a problem, or why is that a problem for you? And she said, well, because um, he says we have one or two drinks a night, but his drinks are like in a vat. So when we have one or two drinks, it's like he has three drinks in a for every one. So it's like he's having six martinis instead of three. So does that give you a bigger picture when you're interviewing both? It absolutely gives me a, a bigger picture. And when you're interviewing the woman or, or the victim of abuse, do you, do you find that that person tends to minimize what's actually happening in, in the home? Isn't it a shame she never got to interview Travis? Yeah, but even if she'd interviewed Travis, she would have come down Team Jody. Yeah, that's true. Most of the time, the women are protective of, of the men that they're with, and they are very cautious about telling me, uh, for instance, I'm a mandated reporter, so if they re um, report child abuse, I have to report it. So I, I tell them the limits of my confidentiality, that these are the things that I'm going to have to report. I have to report child abuse if that's occurring, and I have to report a danger to self or others. So if there's an imminent threat, so if somebody comes into the office and says I'm going to, you know, seriously injure or hurt somebody, I have to do something about that. So I tell them the limits of my confidentiality, and then we, you know, we talk. Uh -huh. um, and it's a very, you know, it's very conversational. I don't have, like, you know, a lot of papers and fill things out. I, I try to just have an, a conversation with people. But I ask them questions. I ask them both the same kinds of questions to sort of see if there's a, a, a great difference in the stories. Because if there's a big difference in the stories, I've got a bigger problem. And if the stories match up a little bit, 
it, uh, it's usually because both people are feeling like they can tell the truth a little more and there's not as much shame attached or something that they're able to do that. Okay. Um. I've been closely watching Jody as well while Alice has been talking about, you know, all of these cases she's worked with and all of the um, stories that she's told. I've been watching Jody. Now, bear in mind that these two women, Jody and Alice, have spent a significant amount of time together. Apparently, according to people in our comments, we... Yeah. Um, but by now, they, they know each other pretty well and they've spent a lot of time together. And she is very much, you know, she's drunk the Kool-Aid, Alice, hasn't she? Oh, of course she is. She's definitely on Jody's side. Or to be more accurate, the flavour aid than the Kool-Aid. But anyway, whenever Alice has been relating these stories telling these stories of, of, you know, very real, pe real people going through very real problems and she's encountered moments of levity and she smiled and the camera's been cut to Jodie and there is nothing. There's just blank stares coming from Jodie. Even, you know, the, the more, you know, the sadder cases or the most har more harrowing cases that she's told us about so far, she's, there's nothing. She, no, she's stoned, she's stony-faced. I don't know whether they've gone through all this in rehearsal or not, but if they haven't, you know, there's no smile, there's no kind of empathetic, you know, we're sisters, we're in this together sort of smile coming from Jodie. There's loads coming from Alice. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Well, well while I mean, she's testifying. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, what they should have done is said to Jodie, when... Alice is telling her stories, you need to kind of react because she's supposed to have suffered the same as these women. Yeah. And she's not showing exactly. anything. Exactly. The, the, there's no reaction. And you would think that some of these stories that Alice has related, if Jodie has PTSD, it may have triggered her and you may have seen some sort of, you know, physical response coming from her, at least shaking. Not a thing. Nothing. So, while you're listening to this, you know, while, while it's going on, she, you know, she, while she's relating the cases, I've got every, you know, empathy for the people that went through this, but there's no relevance to this case. But while you're listening to all of this, keep your eye on Jodie. There is nothing coming from her. There is no emotion, no empathy, no relatability to kind of the, the very human problems that Alice is describing. There's nothing. No, just deadpan. It's like a blank sheet, isn't it? It is. Do you ever, do you ever um, counsel couples together if they're in a domestic violence relationship? I will not... I, I can't think of uh, domestic violence couples I've counseled together uh, for a few reasons. One is that, um, first of all, when I do an intake, even in couples counseling, I separate people so I can hear two different versions, whatever they're going to tell me about what's going on in their lives, because I never know if somebody's referring to me for domestic violence or for couples counseling. I, I don't know. And so I, I separate couples so I get more of a picture of what's going on. And um, then when I bring people back together, we can talk about what might be a good strategy, what might be a good way to work, what might be a good referral if they need a referral, that sort of thing. But if it turns out that they're coming in and um, he's going to, you know, participate in my group, uh, I'm definitely not going to, first of all, it would be a conflict to counsel them together. But if there's domestic violence, safety is an issue that we look at very seriously. So the safety of the survivor is really important. If we bring them together in a couples counseling situation, we actually don't know what happens when they go home, if it's contentious in that situation. We don't know what we could be, you know, sort of generating in that situation. So safety reasons. Um, the second thing is that when there's a situation where one person feels like the bad guy, they usually feel like their partner is a, is a better person than they are. And if they don't know how to make that level, the only thing they know how to do is level the playing field. So if you're leveling the playing field, what happens is if you leave and you're in couples counseling is you remember what the therapist has said about your partner and not what they've said about you. So 
you know, doing couples counseling for me means that there has to be some kind of balance in the relationship so you don't have a, a you know, good guy, bad guy situation going on. Um, and the I, third... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go thing. ahead. No, go ahead.